You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. If you are in the habit of reading your Bible every day, which I trust you are, I assume that you are, it's a good discipline and a good habit to be in, then you've probably had one of those experiences where you're just reading through the passage for today and uh, taking note of what is there, and then you have a verse or a passage or a detail that sort of jumps off the page and you see it fresh like you've never seen it before, even though you've read it a hundred times and you've seen it a hundred times, and maybe you've even heard the verse preached on, but suddenly because of something going on in your life or some question that you have or something that you're dealing with or or know somebody that's dealing with, the passage sort of takes on a whole new significance and a whole new meaning and just sort of comes alive in flesh and blood on the page. I've had that happen a couple times to me in the last couple of weeks. And it is due to the fact that, I should back up, when it happens to me it's usually because I'm dealing with something or I'm thinking along a subject line or studying something And the fact that I am studying Acts 20 and Paul's address to the Ephesian elders, the pastors of the church in Ephesus, that has caused, um, as I'm reading through the Bible, certain things to sort of jump off the page. And one of them was in the Gospel of Matthew. I've been in Matthew and Mark the last couple of weeks. Last week in Matthew, I read Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, where it says of Jesus that seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And I started to think to myself, what was going on in Jesus' day and what did he see? He saw these crowds coming out to him and he saw the people who were dispirited and sort of distressed and he felt compassion for them. You see, the Lord loves his sheep. And the reason he felt compassion for them is because they were sheep without shepherds. The Gospel of Mark. Mark mentions sort of the same thing, but Mark adds a little detail and listen to the different detail that Mark adds. Mark chapter 6, verse 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. You notice the detail? He began to teach them many things. The crowds came out and Jesus saw the crowds and Jesus thought to himself, these people are like sheep that have no shepherd. And he felt compassion for them and so what did Jesus do? He cracked open the Old Testament and he began to teach the people. Why was it that Jesus felt compassion for them? They were sheep who had no shepherd. They had no teachers. And the crowds would throng around Jesus and some people would come and they would stand by Him and they would hang around Jesus because they believed that He had supernatural power to make them well. Some people believed that He was Christ, the Son of God, and that the miracles that He did, He did in the name of God and by the power of God, and so the people would come because they needed to be made well, and He would make them well. Others came because they wanted to see Him perform a sign. They may not have needed to be made well, but they knew that when Jesus got around sick people or dead people or demon-possessed people, it was always a show. And so they had this morbid sense of curiosity, always saying, show us a sign. Demonstrate to us that You are the Son of God. And they wanted to see the sign that Jesus would perform. They thought He was some sort of a circus performer. That was their sort of approach to the Son of God. Others came and by their own lips they said, this man teaches like no other man teaches. What were they hungry for? The Word. When Jesus saw the crowd, He saw that they were sheep without a shepherd, and so He began to teach the people many things. That's why the crowds hung around Jesus. And God in His wisdom has given to His church because He loves His sheep and because He wants His sheep cared for and He wants His sheep protected. God in His wisdom and in His perfect providence has come up with a way to see that His sheep get fed and protected and prospered and watched out after. And that perfect plan of God is what we refer to as the ministry of eldership or the ministry of shepherding or pastoring. Paul gives some instruction to the shepherds or to the pastors of the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. And you'll need to have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 20. He 
In Jesus' day, they had Pharisees who called themselves teachers. The Pharisees were the strict, legalistic, self-righteous people of Jesus' day. And they were the self-proclaimed teachers of the people. And they would make a convert. And in Jesus' own word, he said, when you make a convert of somebody, you make them twice as much a son of hell as yourself. He was very angry with them for their teaching and for what they were doing to the flock and that the Pharisees would put upon the people these burdens of outward manifestations of righteousness. There were the Sadducees who were the theological liberals of Jesus' day. They didn't teach the people because if you're a theological liberal, that means you deny all of the cardinal doctrines of the Jewish and Christian faith. And so the Sadducees weren't teaching the people. They didn't have anything to teach the people. They denied everything. So they weren't teaching the people. The scribes and the priests of Jesus' day were more interested in maintaining their own wealth and their position of power and their influence than they were in teaching the people. And so when the people came out to Jesus to hear Him teach, He was felt feeling compassion for them because He knew these people are not being taught. And He wanted to see them taught. And so He taught them many things. Ezekiel chapter 34, the number one charge against the false shepherds of Israel that Ezekiel levels at the top of the list, you did not feed my sheep. Now there were other things that the false shepherds were doing. They were taking advantage of the sheep. They weren't binding up the broken hearted. They weren't healing people. They weren't encouraging people. They weren't gathering the flock. There was a lot of things that they were doing, but all of that revolved around you are not feeding my sheep. That's how Ezekiel starts the list of charges against the false shepherds. And that's how he ends the list of charges against the false shepherds. You've not fed my sheep. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul is telling the Ephesian elders, you must feed my sheep. We've looked at the type of ministry that Paul had in the church of Ephesus and the type of ministry that he is telling these elders to have. In verses 18 to 21, we saw that it was a persistent ministry. In verses 22 through 24, we saw that it was a purposeful ministry. In verses 25 through 27, we saw that the Apostle Paul modeled a preaching ministry. He preached boldly, he preached comprehensively, and he preached responsibly in the church. Now today we're going to begin looking at the protective ministry that is in verses 28 through 32. And I want to give you a little preview of where we're going in the coming weeks. Read verse 28 with me. In verse 28, the Apostle Paul gives to them the mandate to protect the flock. The mandate. Look at verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. Now verses 29 and 30, the Apostle Paul describes the men from whom we are to protect the flock. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Verse 31, Be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. That's a method of protecting the flock. We see the mandate in verse 28, the men against whom we're to protect the flock, and then the method, warning night and day for three years, verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Today we're just going to look at this mandate. Verse 28, the mandate to protect the flock. And I want you to read it again with me. Look at it, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. Friends, listen. These verses are the central verses of the whole address to the Ephesian elders. This is where the Bible student pulls out his highlighter and goes to town. Because this is the center of it all. This is the heart of it all. This is where the Apostle Paul is zeroing in on them, and he is defining and crystallizing their ministry. It is to be one of preaching, and it is also to be one of protection and protecting the flock. Be on guard, the Apostle Paul says. It's an imperative, and it's in a, it's in a Greek tense that has to do with, or, or kind of carries the idea of continuing on and on. It's as if the Apostle Paul is saying, keep on watching. Never give up. You have to be alert. Your eyes have to be open. Your ears have to be tuned. 
You have to know what to listen for. You have to know what to look for. You have to know how to spot the dangers before the dangers come. You need to be on guard all the time. Jesus used the same word in Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They come with sheep's clothing. You reach out and touch them and they feel like sheep. That's wool if I have ever felt it. And you'd swear it's wool. And they look like sheep. They smell like sheep. And they can go bad, bad, and they sound like sheep. And you would swear on your mother's grave, it's a sheep. But Jesus said you have to beware. Because inwardly, they pull off the wool and they are ravenous wolves. They look, they smell, they sound, they appear, they act like sheep. That's why you have to be aware. Wolves don't come in the front door of the church and say, I'm a wolf and I'm here to take over, to take charge and to ravish the flock. They never do that. Never. They come in amongst you secretly, quietly, and Jesus said, you have to beware because they come in sheep's clothing. But inside they're wolves. And the reason they come is so that they can stand up and begin to speak perverse things and to draw away disciples after themselves. And they ravage the flock. Be alert. Be aware. Over two things. Be on guard over two things. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. First, for yourselves. Second, for all the flock. Let's take them in that order. You have to be on the alert for yourself. You see, friends, you can't guard somebody else if you can't guard yourself. If I can't protect myself, I can't protect my child. If I can't protect myself, I can't protect my wife. And an elder or a pastor, an overseer, must be somebody who is able to guard their own heart, their own lives, their own thinking, their own doctrine, their own practice, their own teaching from false teaching. And they have to be able to stand on guard for themselves before they can protect the flock. If an elder cannot discern the difference between truth and error, he cannot protect his flock from error. If a pastor or a shepherd or an overseer cannot discern the difference between a wolf and a sheep, he cannot protect the sheep from the wolf. He has to guard himself first because it begins at home. And listen, fathers, this principle, whether you're an elder or not, applies to you. As fathers, you cannot teach your children morals if you're an immoral individual. You cannot teach your children discernment if you are not discerning. You cannot teach your children truth if you can't discern the truth. It has to start with you. You have to guard yourself. I once had a pastor friend. No, sorry. More accurately, I once had a pastor tell me. It wasn't a friend. I once had a pastor tell me. My mentor is Robert Schuler. My mentor is Robert Schuler. The minute he said it, I thought to myself, Robert Schuler has done more to destroy the Christian church from inside the Christian church than any individual in the history of the church, with the only possible exception being Pelagius. He has done more to destroy the church from inside the church, and this shepherd's mentor is this false teacher. Do you think he's guarding his flock against false teaching? has to begin here, doesn't it? That's what Paul told Timothy. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. You see, Paul left Timothy in the church in Ephesus. This is after Acts chapter 20. Paul left Timothy in the church at Ephesus to deal with the doctrinal issues and the false teachers, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who had crept into the church and made shipwreck of people's faith. And so Paul dropped Timothy off there and he left and he went on to Troas where he wrote 1 Timothy to Timothy. And in this book, instructing Timothy on how to deal with false teachers and false teaching, Almost all of chapter 4 is devoted to instructing Timothy how to look out for himself. Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Why did Paul say that to Timothy? Because Timothy can't guard the flock if Timothy can't guard himself. You have to watch out for yourselves. Pay close attention to yourself. Examine your own heart, your own practice, your own doctrine, your own teaching, Timothy, then you will be able to instruct others in the words of the faith and the sound doctrine which you've been following. And so Paul told Timothy, persevere in these things. Because if you do that, if you examine yourself and you watch yourself 
and you guard yourself, then you will ensure deliverance not only for yourself, but for all of those who hear you. Paul knew the order. You gotta guard yourself before you can guard other people. Beware, be on the guard for yourselves, second, for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Paul's telling these shepherds, you have to watch out for yourself because the first line of defense is right here. And you have to examine your own heart, your own life, your own doctrine, your own teaching to make sure that it is in accordance with Scripture and do so with diligence and with discipline. And then having done that, then you're able to watch out for the whole flock. And it's a shepherding analogy, like a shepherd that is out in the field with his sheep overnight. And he has been allotted a certain number of sheep that have been given to his care. And he is watching out for them. Woe to the shepherd that falls asleep while the wolves and the bears and all of the predators come in and ravage the sheep. The shepherd has to be aware of the wolves. He has to guard himself from the wolves because if the shepherd lets the wolves tackle him and take him apart and ravage him, then there's nobody left to protect the flock. That's why it's in that order. Yourselves and then all the flock. He's saying to these elders, you need to watch out for the wolves, you need to watch out for the false teachers, and you need to protect the church from there and from them and be on guard, not only for yourself, but also for all the flock. Titus chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 says, the qualifications for an elder is he must do this. He must hold fast to the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to do two things. Listen. He will be able to exhort those in the faith. And second, that he will be able to refute those who contradict. And then Paul goes on to say, there are many deceivers and empty talkers and vain men who are upsetting whole households teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Titus, you have to appoint men in the churches who are able to teach the sheep and to refute the wolves. It's not enough to be able to just teach. You have to be able to do battle with the wolves. And that requires a spine, doesn't it? It requires a backbone to stand up and to say, this is truth, and here is the line. We will not go past this. We will not go over it, and we're not going to give up any ground to error, to false teaching, or to wolves. It takes a spine. Many a shepherd today, to be honest with you, and I've seen it happen hundreds of times, Many a shepherd today just lays down and rolls over and lets the winds of doctrine come blowing into the church and wreak havoc in the church among the believers. They don't stand up to false teaching. They're not able to refute those who contradict. An elder, a shepherd, a pastor has to be able to stand toe-to-toe with a false teacher and give him truth, not only to teach the sheep, but to fight against the wolves and to contend earnestly passionately for the faith which has been once for all delivered to the saints. And if he can't do that, he's a negligent shepherd. 100% of the time, he's a negligent shepherd. You have to be on guard for yourselves and then for all the flock. Watching out, keeping watching, constantly guarding to see to it that false doctrine does not creep into not only your own life and that you don't compromise morally and theologically in your own teaching, but also that those types of things do not come in and wreak havoc in the church. Paul says you have to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. I want you to notice that word overseer. It's a Greek word and it has to do with the administration or the oversight of the body of Christ. It means to look over, to watch over. What an appropriate word to use in the context of being on guard and watching over the flock. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now listen. An overseer is the same thing as an elder. Don't get them mixed up. An overseer is the same thing as an elder. It's the same thing as a pastor. All three of those words are used of the same office, the same function, and the same person in Scripture. And oh, I wish that that concept had not been lost sometime in church history, likely before the Reformation it was lost, when he started to have all of this hierarchy and he had bishops and many bishops and many, many bishops and then you had pastors over these guys and you had this... (coughs) Excuse me, you had this hierarchical structure within the church. The Bible, the Scriptures, only recognize one office of oversight, and that's the pastor, elder, bishop, deacon, or not deacon, pastor, elder, bishop, overseer. Whatever one of those terms you use, that's whom Paul is addressing. Verse 17, Luke calls them elders. Verse 28, Paul calls them overseers and tells them to pastor the church. They're the same office. They're the same function. 
They're overseers. An overseer or an elder or a pastor, his job, his responsibility, his ministry is to oversee the body of Christ. That is to watch over people's souls. In fact, that's how the author of Hebrews describes the office of an overseer. Hebrews 13, 17, the author says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. They're overseers of souls. They look out for you. That's how God in His providence, by His grace, by His goodness, has seen to the care of His sheep. He, in the person of the Holy Spirit, has appointed elders or pastors and teachers to oversee, that is, to watch over the ministry of the church. So that everything that pertains to the life and the direction and the the health of the church is under the oversight of those whom the Holy Spirit has appointed to it. I want you to notice that it's the Holy Spirit who has made them overseers. Notice it doesn't say, shepherd the church of God among which you were elected as officers to serve in that office. It doesn't say that, does it? No. Why? Because we're not talking about an elected office. It's not a popularity contest. What it is, it's a gifting and a calling that God has placed upon the lives of certain men to function in a certain capacity within the church. And you say, how do we know? How do we know if God has indeed appointed this man or to be an overseer, to be a pastor or an elder? How do we know if that's the Holy Spirit's doing or if that's our doing? Well, how do I know if somebody should be a teacher in the church? How do you know that? What do you look at? Giftedness. Right? Nobody wants to listen to somebody teach who can't teach. So what do you look for? You look for giftedness. The Holy Spirit assigns ministry and function and office within the body of Christ on the basis of giftedness. Ministry according to giftedness. You look at an individual and you say, are they qualified according to Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3 and 1 Peter chapter 5? Do they meet those qualifications? Have they been given the gift of teaching? Do they study the Scriptures? Are they sound in doctrine? Can they teach those sheep and refute those who contradict? Can they fight against wolves? Can they recognize wolves? Well, if they have the qualifications and the calling and the giftedness and they're functioning in that capacity, then the body of Christ recognizes them for what the Holy Spirit has made them by giftedness and by service and by calling. It's the Holy Spirit who appoints those individuals. And as the flock, we simply recognize those that God has called to that service who have those qualities and we say, yeah, he's an elder. How do I know that? Because he's eldering. And it's not our ministry to assign. It's not our ministry to to promote, we're not the one who assigns those roles in the church. Look, you take somebody who can't teach, not sound in doctrine, doesn't like to study Scripture, couldn't discern truth from error if we're both labeled with big white letters, they can't do battle with the wolves, and you put them in a position of oversight, and you have a recipe for disaster 100% of the time. Every time. It's not ours to assign those roles. That is the work of the Spirit of God, and He does it on the basis of giftedness. You are, Paul says, to be on guard for yourself and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers and has given you the ministry of oversight. To shepherd it. What does it mean to shepherd? It's an agricultural analogy that Paul's using of of the shepherding task in the nation of Israel. What does it mean to shepherd? Primarily, it's three things. It's leading, feeding, and protecting. It's leading. In those days, the sheep needed to be led. And the shepherd would go out in the field and there was more desert in the land of Israel than there was water. And the shepherd would take the sheep from one location to another location and he would lead them. And the sheep would follow the shepherd. And his responsibility was to give direction and guidance and leadership and purpose and vision to the flock. That's the job of an overseer. He's to lead the sheep. Second, he's to feed the sheep. He has a responsibility to feed the sheep. And the shepherds and the pastors and elders of a church have the responsibility to oversee the feeding of the flock and to be involved in that feeding of the flock. That's their primary responsibility. It's not administration. It's not groundskeeping. It's not being in hospitals and doing funerals and all of those other things. All of those other things may be good. And I do them and the other elders do them. But that's not the primary focus. The primary, fundamental, basic requirement of a shepherd is to feed the flock. Because listen what happens when somebody isn't being fed. When the sheep are not being fed, then that's when the sheep get ravaged. I want you to notice something about verse 28. I want you to notice that it follows verse 27. You say, that's profound. Well, I know it is, but what did we talk about last week? Preaching ministry. 
And what did I tell you? The responsibility of a shepherd, the responsibility of an elder, is to explain the revelation as the revelation was given. To explain the Word of God as the Word of God was given. Feeding the sheep. And it is immediately on the heels of feeding the sheep and the idea of preaching that the Apostle Paul moves to protecting the sheep. Why? Because the two are inseparably linked. And if you have a church that's not being fed, they're not being taught the Scripture, and they're not understanding Scripture, then you're going to have a bunch of, bunch of emaciated, starving sheep who will gobble up any false doctrine weed that sprouts in the pasture. And they eat it up because they can't tell the difference between truth or error because they've never heard the truth taught. They've heard a lot of Christian things said from the pulpit, but they've never heard the truth taught. John MacArthur puts it well. He says this, Sadly, many under-shepherds today fail to do that. Seemingly content to lead the sheep from one barren wasteland to another, the tragic result is a spiritually weak flock ready to eat the poisonous weeds of false doctrine or to follow false shepherds who deceitfully promise them greener pastures while leading them to barren desert. End quote. It's exactly true. Shepherds have the responsibility to protect the flock by leading the flock out of danger, away from danger, by feeding the flock so they can recognize danger, and by protecting the flock. A shepherd, a pastor, an elder, an overseer has to be able to see danger on the horizon and act against it before it ever approaches the church. Because sadly enough, most sheep, most Christians cannot discern dangers. That shouldn't be as it is, but that is the way that it is. Most Christians simply do not even know a danger is there until it's already in the body and manifests itself in such a way that it's already ravaged the flock. You ever watch a... Well, what's that show? It's uh, the channel Animal Planet. You know, and, and if you're kind of like me, then you like to see these big animals ravage the little animals and go out and you like to see the food chain at work out in nature, out in the fields of Africa. And so you see these these animals singling out the the weakest zebra in the crowd and they run and they pounce on that zebra and everybody leaves them behind. And sometimes you can see these animals that are predators come into a crowd and they can be in there and they can be chewing and killing on an animal while all the other ones are just standing around. They don't even know the danger is present. They don't even realize what's going on. An elder has to be able to protect the flock so that he can see the danger, deal with the danger, see the wolf, confront the wolf, deal with the wolf before the flock even knows there was a wolf on the horizon. But that can't happen if your mentor is Robert Schuller. Now, my mentor is Arius. What would you do with a pastor who said, my mentor is Arius, the guy that denied the deity of Christ? What would you do with that? If you can't protect yourself, you can't protect the flock. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd, that is to lead, to feed, and protect the church of God. Look at the end of verse 28. Powerful little phrase. The church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I want you to know something. That's the greatest motivation in the world for fulfilling the task and the responsibility of being a shepherd. Because it is the church of God. That's the first motivation. Shepherds understand it's not my flock. You don't belong to me. I've been given a charge. I have been given authority. I have been given a ministry and a responsibility. But I exercise that under the chief shepherd knowing that you don't belong to me. And the Lord is free to take you home or move you on or do whatever He wants with you. Because you don't belong to me. It's not my flock to oppress. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, you don't exercise lordship over them. You don't oppress the flock. But you you shepherd them lovingly, guiding them and leading them and feeding them and sacrificing for them. Why? Because it's the church of God. Not your church or my church or Jess's church or Dave's church. It's the church of the living God. It's a valuable thing, isn't it? I know it is, because look what the end of verse 28 says. He purchased it with his own blood. Now answer this question. Who died on the cross? Even the smallest one among us could say that. Did you hear that? Jesus, he said. Yet Paul could say that God purchased the church with his own blood. Whose blood was shed on the cross? Acts 20.28. Who was Jesus Christ? God. In Him that is in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Ephesians chapter 1. Titus chapter 2. He redeemed us. That is, He bought us by His sacrifice to redeem a people for His own possession. 
1 Peter chapter 1, we're not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot or without blemish. It's Christ's blood that was shed, and yet because of His essential unity with the Father, because He is the God-man, because He is the second person of the Trinity, Paul could speak of the sacrifice on Calvary as being the shedding of the blood of God. It is the church of God which God purchased with His own blood. Look how Paul viewed the church. As a blood-bought community of saints. This church, this gathering of the elect of God, have been bought by the blood of Christ. Is that how you view the church when you come here on Sunday mornings? Or for you, is it just your Sunday morning social time? You get up on Sunday morning, and oh, you can take church, I can leave church. No big deal. I, I really don't care if I ever see those people. You think Paul had that? Mentality? Look at his view of the church. When you gather here together on Sunday mornings, friend, you gather with the blood-bought saints of God. God paid a price for the person sitting next to you. He shed his own blood. And an elder, a pastor, a teacher has been given the task of protecting the most valuable thing on earth. Name me one other thing that God shed his own blood for. One other thing. There's nothing as valuable as the blood-bought community of the saints. And listen, I want my children to understand that. And I want my children to understand that when they come to church, they come to church to worship with blood-bought people. People who have been ransomed by God's own blood. That's not a small price. And I want my children to understand that if you neglect the fellowship of the saints, and if you neglect to come together with God's people on a Sunday morning, you do so to the detriment of and possibly the destruction of your own soul. Listen to me. The lower your view of the church, the lower your view of the blood of Christ, and the lower your view of God. Don't tell me that I love something, that you love Christ if you don't love what Christ loves. What does He love? He loves His people that He bought with His own blood. He loves His bride. He loves His body. He loves His people. And you come here together, friends, you are coming together with people who have been ransomed, who have been purchased with a price. And this gathering of people, along with all other like gatherings of true believers on the face of this planet, is the most precious thing in all of the world. It is the most valuable thing that has ever existed. Why? Because it was ransomed and purchased by God's blood. He paid that price. Now we're talking about serious things, aren't we? You say, well, we'll just have church at home today. Oh, we'll read a hymn, sing a hymn, read a passage, share our ignorance about what the passage means, close it up, have a prayer. That'll be our church for today. Baloney. No. You do that, you do two things. You show your own contempt for the blood of Christ, your own contempt for His church, your own contempt for the leadership of His church, and then you train your child to show the same contempt for the sacrifice of Christ, for His church which was bought with His blood, and for His blood itself. Uh, we'll just have church outside today. We're camping. We're just going to hang out. We'll have a little mini church service, just our little family. We don't need to get together with the saints of God. We don't need to fellowship with the people of God. No. You demonstrate your utter contempt for the sacrifice of Christ that purchased the gathering of the saints and His elect out of all the corners of the earth with His own blood. And when we come together here on a Sunday morning, this is the Holy of Holies there's nothing more valuable than this. There's nothing more precious on all of the face of the earth than this thing. And so woe to the shepherd who does not protect the most valuable thing on earth. And woe to the man or the woman who attacks the church. Woe to the man or the woman who leaves in their path destruction and division and strife and stirred up believers who go from one church to another finding things that they can criticize and attack and not like and destroy and pick at. Woe to the man. Woe to the man who attacks the leadership of the church. Because to do that is to attack God Himself. And woe to the individual who tries to introduce false doctrine and false teaching to the sheep. You're just sowing poison amongst people. Friends, that is how valuable the church is and that is how seriously God takes these things. We are the blood-bought community of God's people, whom He redeemed with His own sacrifice 
and His own blood. And it is the most precious thing in all of the world that has ever existed. Lower your view of the church, the lower your view of the blood of Christ, and the lower your view of the sacrifice that He paid to purchase the church. Don't say that you love Christ if you don't love what Christ loves. Next time we're together, it won't be next week because next week is Resurrection Sunday. Next time we're together, we're going to look at the question of who are these men? Who are these men who would dare to creep in and speak perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves? Who are these ravenous wolves who come after the flock? Who would dare to rise up and to attack the blood-bought flock of God? Who are they? We'll look at them in verses 29 and 30. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank You this morning that You have bought us and You have redeemed us and You have paid for us a price. It is beyond our comprehension or our ability to even fathom that You as our God, as our Savior, would shed Your own blood to purchase us, to redeem us from death. We are dead men who have been called to come out of our grave. We thank You for that sacrifice which atoned for all of our sins and provided for us salvation, sanctification, and security in your flock and in your Son. We thank you that we are accepted in the Beloved, and we thank you for the privilege that it is to be amongst the called out ones, to be amongst those who have been bought by the blood of Christ. It's humbling to us, because we know that we are not valuable at all. And it is only the fact that you sacrificed that gives any value to the church whatsoever. It's not because of us. And so we thank you for all of this. We commit ourselves to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1 for our communion service this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from verse 3 all the way through the end of verse 14. I invite you to follow along as we read. This is to prepare our hearts a little bit for communion. And Between verses 3 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul goes from eternity past to eternity future. He leaves nothing undone. Back before the foundation of the world, certain things happened. Eternity past. He goes back before there was time, before there was anything, as far back as your mind can go. That's where the Apostle Paul begins in verse 3. Then by the time we get within ten verses, he goes all the way through the present and all the way into eternity future and the summing up of all things in Christ and everything that is to come. God's eternal and perfect, wonderful plan from past to future in just ten verses. Now wonderful, watch it. These are the blessings of salvation, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us, In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given to us as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. I want you to notice a couple things in the passage. First of all, I want you to notice the words predestined, predestined to an adoption, predestined to an inheritance, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, all to the praise of His glorious grace. Second thing I want you to notice is the redemption terms. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood. Look at verse 14, with a view to the end which is the redemption of God's own possession. All of that, the predestining, the redemption, the predestining eternity past, the redemption, the present, 
and the future, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. This is the perfect plan of God. That He, before He ever created a single atom or a single angel, gave to us an inheritance, gave to us an adoption, because He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and He set in plan a redemptive, He set in motion a redemptive plan where He would create a world and populate it with people. And He would display His glory and His magnificence and His majesty through the redemption of those people to be an inheritance, to be to the eternal praise of His glorious grace. In eternity past, He chose them. He predestined us to an adoption. He predestined our inheritance. And then He brought the Word of God to bear on our hearts so that we would believe and we would be sealed with the Spirit of God and kept until all of this is summed up in Christ in eternity future. What a wonderful promise. All of that plan of salvation, all of those wonderful blessings of salvation, brought to us by the blood of God, who shed His blood for the church. That's what it means to be redeemed. In Him we have redemption. In Him we have been purchased. A price has been paid, and we have been purchased. That's why we're not our own. We're bought with a price. As you sit here this morning, I just want you to think about that fact. In eternity past, God said, I'm going to shed my blood to purchase a people. Didn't have to do that, did he? Did it to the display of his magnificent, glorious grace. And so then he has called out us, having been purchased by the blood of Christ. And so as we celebrate communion this morning, I want to encourage you to do two things. First of all, if you're sitting here this morning and you've never trusted Christ for salvation, and you have never repented of your sin and turned from your sin and acknowledged that before a holy God and believed on Him in faith for that forgiveness, for that redemption that He has purchased for you, then I would encourage you to do that today before you partake of communion. The Scripture says that you partake of communion in an unworthy manner. You eat and drink damnation or judgment unto yourself. Second, as believers sitting here this morning, we need to examine our own hearts and minds and our own lives and to pay close attention to ourselves so that we can partake of communion with pure hearts. Because as we do this, friends, this is a symbol of the price that was paid to forgive our sins. And we make a mockery of it if we partake of it while we harbor sin in our hearts. So we don't want to do that because that's partaking of the the elements in an unworthy manner as well. So let's take a few moments. We'll pray together, examine our own hearts, and then I'll call the ushers forward to help serve the elements. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.